All right, everybody, coming to you live from the backyard. It is hot out here in Arizona, but I wanted to talk to you guys about my experiences with frozen shoulder and how I approach this, with, which might be a little differently than some other physicians approach this. First thing, frozen shoulder is a condition of the shoulder where we have a reduction in the range of motion. Usually we're looking for three different uh, uh, planes of motion that we have a restriction. A lot of people are gonna be restricted kind of going up in front of them, out overhead, and then also either internally or externally uh, rotating and then potentially behind as well. So basically we get this locked down frozen shoulder where patients have a lot of pain when they go in through different ranges of motion. Now, the, the different things that I think about is one, why is this happening? So was there a recent surgery that could have caused some uh, potentially damage in the area? which caused this inflammation and potential fibrosis. Again, frozen shoulder is not fully understood at this point. There are some prevailing theories on exactly what is happening with this loss of motion. The, the camp that I'm more, more buy into or more um, accept based on kind of my understanding of the human body is that we are getting a contraction of the myofibroblasts, which make up part of the fascia, but we're basically getting this slow constriction of the fascia around the shoulder joint, the actual joint capsule, which then causes this reduction in, in range of motion. Now, why this happens is still not understood, and I don't have great theories other than something triggers this reaction to occur. A lot of the times this is post-surgery complications. So something happens with the surgery that then results in this contraction of the myofibroblasts. But the other thing that uh, seems to play out quite a bit is both hypothyroidism and diabetes have an increased risk of uh, of patients developing frozen shoulder. And there's a, so there is a metabolic link in all of this. And so when I'm stepping back to try and figure out why did this happen, I always have to think about the metabolic underlying contributors because if someone is hypothyroid and we just try to address the shoulder without addressing that part, we're missing a huge piece. And so, so that's one of the first things I, I look at is the, the metabolic underpinnings of what's going on. But then we also look at, you know, different structures in the shoulder and, and if they might be implicated. And so one of the things that I, I tend to focus on a lot more is the peripheral cutaneous nerves. The reason for this is because the nerves not only provide the sensation of pain to the patient, but they also can control this slow contraction of the fascia through its innervations. And so things like the suprascapular nerve we can go in and we can do a nerve hydrodissection with 5% dextrose or platelet-poor plasma or exosomes, and we can get a positive clinical response because we are essentially treating a part of this larger global thing that's happening, which is the contraction of the myofibroblast. Now, have had a few cases where we've caught the contractions really early. We go in with some perineural injection therapy, so we're doing the 5% dextrose subcutaneously for the axillary nerve and its branches, the suprascapular nerve and its, and its branches, and we are able to actually mitigate and not have the full-blown frozen shoulder come on. Now, that's that's rare to get someone really early in the stages like that because most people don't realize when this is actually happening. The other thing that I've done that seems to provide uh, some positive relief for the patients, I don't have enough data yet to know if it is long-term changing the course of the disease, but what seems to improve patients' range of motion and pain is actually called nerve, or sorry, not nerve, but it's actually called hydrodilation of the shoulder. And so what this is, is under ultrasound, we're going into the shoulder joint and we're injecting a large amount of fluid. And we are actually trying to help expand 
the shoulder joint. Now, the fluid I'm going to use is going to be a 5% dextrose-based solution. So the same solution as the perineural. Why? Because this impacts the nerves and so it can reduce the pain. And sometimes we've also done mixed the 5% dextrose with platelet poor plasma to get some of the cytokines that are going to be beneficial for modulating some of the inflammation that might be present. And so under ultrasound, we're injecting anywhere between 10 to about 25, 30 cc's of fluid, which is going to expand the capsule of the joint and give us more range of motion based off that. But then we also take the patient through some passive range of motion because we are trying to, again, free up maybe some potential fascial adhesions, get some more fluidity in that joint. So that way we can potentially change the prognosis of the disease. But again, I don't have enough patients under me uh, to really know and you know seeing them long enough to really know if that's making a huge long-term impact. But every single time we've done this, it has improved the patient's pain and range of motion anywhere between 10 to 40%, and that lasts anywhere from three to six weeks. And so it's a strategy that we have at this point, but that's kind of how I, I look at uh, frozen shoulder, how it's happening, what, what we're gonna do about it, and how we can treat it. All right, everyone, see you later.